you open up your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5, the end of Ephesians 5 is where we're going to begin. In fact, if you, uh, as you were listening earlier, Pastor Gary read the passage that I am uh, going to use this morning. Uh, We're talking about something very relevant today, fathers. Does that sound like an interesting subject? Too bad if it's not. That's what I'm talking about. (laughs) But Ephesians is uh, one of the places in the Bible that gives us instructions. Um, I'm probably showing my age just a little bit by this title of a message. Uh, Pastor Andy and I have many times laughed as we're putting a series together and praying sometimes months out going, okay, you know, what do we, what do we call this? What are we, where are we heading with this? Where does God feel like, where we feel like God is moving us to uh, preach or whatever. And then you come up with a title and you go, you know, so this morning I just call it, will the real men stand up? Uh, the title does reveal my age a bit. Some of you older folks, my age and older will remember a game show that was called to tell the truth. Anybody remember to tell the truth? Okay. Uh, This game show ran from 1956, was the year I was born, up to 1968. And then they brought it back for a couple years in the 90s with different characters, uh, but they brought the idea back. Uh, The idea there, if you don't know, was that to have the panel, usually three or four panel members, I don't remember how many, but they would sit there Uh, and try to decide who was telling the truth out of three candidates they would bring up. And it might be Joe the pipe fitter. And so he would come up and say, hi, my name's Joe, I'm a pipe fitter, right? And then somebody else would walk up and say, my name's Joe, I'm a pipe fitter. And the third guy would say the very same thing. And then the panel would ask them questions, right? Try to eliminate. And the more people that this guest fooled, the more money they would get. Uh, I I don't remember or never researched how much money they got. It didn't matter to me, but these panel were guessing, hopefully the right person, uh, or deciding which was the right one and the wrong one out of the questions they asked. And personalities like, I had to look some of these up. I I remembered a couple of them, like Betty White, she was on there for a while, and uh, Kitty Carlisle. I don't remember anything else about any of these people, whether they did anything in show business before or after, except for Betty White. Uh, but Tom Poston, Betty White, Peggy Cass, Gene Rayburn, uh, Phyllis Newman, Kitty Carlisle, oh, probably others too. And they, w- they would uh, do their best to decide who the mystery guest was. Uh, but let me say why that came to my mind as I read this passage and the Lord said, this is where you're going to preach today. Um, Whether you realize it or not, there is a real reason why the world is trying to figure out who real men are today. There is a void there. In our homes and single parent homes and a lack of men in our society that step up and take care of responsibilities. And the world, as we know, the world we live in, would define manhood and men in one way, but the Bible shows us the best way for men to be. So what type of father should we be? What type of man should we be? So the title, Will the Real Men Stand Up, came to my mind. I uh, did some research and, a, and a, a book popped up in my research by a man named Weldon Hardenbrook. And he's written several books, but the, his first one he wrote back in 1998, quite a few years ago. And he called it Missing in, Missing in Action, The Vanishing Manhood of America. He's written one since, a sequel to that. It's not getting any better if you wonder what the statistics are. Uh, but with a great deal of humor, I believe, uh, this Weldon Hardenbrook, uh, talked about different ra- ma- uh, male role models uh, as he sees them being promoted in the world today. Uh, and he named several of them in his book, which I thought were, were great here. First one he calls the macho maniac dad. 
Now, this is an image portrayed by the Rambo, Dirty Harry, Die Hard, Terminator films and action films out there, right? Uh, this is the model of a man who denies his feeling, keeps everything inside, never apologizes, tries to portray an aura of toughness. Then Hardenbrook talks about a kind of man he calls the great pretender. Now, this is the what he called the Archie Bunker type. Now, if you're younger, you'd say, who's Archie Bunker, right? He, but he, uh, he's the type that builds himself up by looking down on others as incompetence. He's irritable, moody, filled with feelings of inadequacy, but never seems to be able to come to terms with them. Hardrick talks about another uh, type. He calls uh, the next type the gender blender. And these are those people that are not sure when you see them, whether they're male or female, they're in our society today. Many in music industry, celebrities and others portray a mask of their masculine identity. And so Hardbrook says something seems to have been lost somewhere, biblically speaking. For years, uh, I, I added one to Hardbrook's. He didn't use this one, but I have. For years, I've been seeing a father portrayed on media and TV. I would call the bumbling idiot. These are the clueless losers. Now, I'm not going to name the sitcoms that you come from, but there are multiples. These are clueless losers that in evening sitcoms who hang their heads, they're scolded by their wives, lectured by their children. If you watch TV very much, you would wonder if there was such a thing as a competent, responsible male role model. That's the world we live in. So if you get your model for manhood from media you will be very confused. We should be getting our role model from Scripture. And uh, you and I will be looking at following God's original design for life and what it really means to be a man. So today, as we look at our Scripture, we're going to reread that. You follow along from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 through chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you will enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. What are we going to do with that? Hmm. Well, several things that I see that the Lord brought to my attention as I was looking through that passage and honestly other passages and other places of Scripture that I'll, I'll share this morning. But whether you are here as a man and you are single, married, with or without children, this is the model for a man. The Bible tells us first in Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It is his good and pleasing and perfect will. See, a man of character does not conform to the world around him. He conforms to the image of God. He models his life after the heart of Jesus. He longs to have qualities and character of Jesus. He has gone beyond just wanting to avoid sin in his life. He's concentrating on the quality of life Jesus lived before us and trying to model that. A godly man wants to imitate the heart of Christ. He wants to have a heart that is transformed. When we start out and we say, Lord, forgive me, come into my heart, I, I, forgive me of my sins, and we make that salvation moment, regeneration begins to happen, and the process that we read about and see in the Bible is what we in the Western Church and many other places call transformation. We are slowly changed into His likeness. And that sometimes is painful. Because giving up self to doing what Christ is calling us to do is not easy. But the Holy Spirit, and Pastor Andy talked about that, the Holy Spirit 
indwells at the moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit comes in and begins to work. Sometimes we don't even realize it, but pretty soon we go, oh, I used to do this, but I don't do this. Now, it's not because there's a set of rules out there, do this and you'll be holy and don't do this, and you won't be, or either or. What it really comes down to is, as we walk with the Lord and in fellowship with Him, and we read and know what the Word of God says, something dynamic happens in our life. We can't help it. We're being changed. We're being transformed. He wants us to have a transformed heart. He wants what is going on inside to match the image of what he projects on the outside. It's an inner transformation. It's genuine without hypocrisy. He encourages and builds up this man that walks with the Lord, will try to encourage and build up his wife and children and doesn't tear them down For he strives to live up to what the scripture says. Father, do not. This is from Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not embitter your children. Or they will become discouraged. I tried not to discourage my children yesterday. My three kids got together and they did this beautiful thing. Right, Nicole? And they said, hey, guess what? Mom and dad, for Father's and Mother's Day, we're giving you a present great. I'm thinking golf balls. Yeah. No, it was a photo session (laughs) with seven littler kids, right? And all the families and everything. And it was so much fun. I tell you what was the best part is the wind was kind of blowing lightly, but it was beautiful. It was a sunny day, and we're in the shade, and we're taking pictures, and I know we're smiling so well. And all I could think of was Fabio with his hair going back. (laughs) Okay, I didn't quite achieve that. Some of them had hair blowing around, but I just very kindly said, thank you guys, this is so meaningful. It will be someday, I'm sure. (laughs) But we had fun, I hope. Some of us did. You know what? Uh, A real man of God doesn't care what everybody else is doing when they act like a real man should and live with integrity and strength. These kinds of fathers that we're talking about today are the kinds of fathers who make a difference in the lives of their children and wives and in the world Why? Because they know Christ is being reflected in their life to some level. I read a story about a pastor who told this story in his congregation uh, of a man that he was closely associated with uh, that was part of the church. This man was a vice president of a company. And at some point, as a vice president, he had to take an unpopular stand for ethical reasons. You see, his boss wanted him to do things he could not do in good conscience. When he refused to go along with what he was asked to do, it went against his moral character, he was fired. But as the story goes on, within the year, he was hired back as the president of the company. Now, that's a man of character. But I began to think, what if he had not been hired back? He would still been that man of character. What if his job was something else rather than the new president? He would, I think, even been more of a man of character because the things he had done was the right thing, even when it cost him something personally. There's a reason why Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It's not that it's all this Christian life is all about just a bed of roses and all wonderful. We have to make choices that at some point in our lives... Contrary to what culture is, people aren't going to like it. Jesus said it'd be that way. When people look at your life, what is the defining characteristic that they see? I'm talking especially to men today, but for ladies as well. For men, do they see someone who loves football and sports? Nothing wrong with sports. I love sports. 
but is it what defines you? Do they see someone who is aggressive and willing to do whatever it takes to get ahead? Nothing wrong with ambition, but is it what defines you? Do they see someone who likes to just have a good time and take it easy? Nothing wrong with rest and enjoyment, but does it define you? When they see you, do they see someone that talks a lot about religion and ethics, but sometimes the way they live is questionable? Are you a person of character who exhibits the genuine spirit of and the heart of Christ? Do you love other people and serve them, even when it might be inconvenient to do so? So to be a man who puts character before conformity, being a man integrity and faithfulness, this is what pleases God and makes your life, I believe, a joy to live. Because as you look back, you go, What's done for Christ will last. Everything else really won't matter. That reason alone is why some of you men here, heroes in the church, men that have stepped up to volunteer in kids' programs and youth programs to help around the church so that our kids and teens and children have role models as men. Thank you, guys. It's making a difference. Because many of those homes these kids are coming from, they don't have those role models. And if they don't see them here, they may not see them. Thank you women as well. But this is Father's Day after all. There are many young people who have great role models. And we thank thankful for those men that are stepping up. But... Even on a Wednesday night, those men that are driving vans and volunteering and cleaning tables and everything that goes with Kids Connect and youth, um, thank you. It's making a difference. I think the second part of what I see in this passage that uh, what it means to be a man is to be a person of consistency. This to me is not someone who tells other people how wrong they are and then has huge gaps in their own moral and ethical behavior. Having consistency is one who talks the talk, but he also walks it. I love the life of and the relationship of Paul and Timothy in the New Testament. Timothy was a man of consistency. Listen to what Paul said about him. I hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to send Timothy to you very soon. Uh, this is, he's writing to the church of Philippi. And he said that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. So I'm sending Timothy. When he's coming back, guess what? He, I know he's going to bring me good news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests. Not those of Christ Jesus, but because those are in Christ, guess what? They love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then they want to serve and not be served. Yeah? So when you see a man like that, you know it's a one of integrity. Timothy was consistent. Timothy had proven himself because he was consistent through his life, through various trials that he faced even along with the Apostle Paul, he didn't run when others did. He didn't deny his faith in order to avoid suffering like some of the companions Paul had earlier. He stayed the course through the good and bad times. The third thing that came to my mind as we looked through some of the, these passages of Ephesians 5 and 6, is if we're going to be a man that God intends us to be, we need to be a man of authenticity. What's that mean? One that is true to himself and to his nature, yes. But one that hasn't let the world squeeze him into some mold. He doesn't try to be someone he's not. He lives out as God-given masculinity. He understands that God has made him male for a reason. He's not just a, a human body with different parts than female. But every cell in his body is different. He's not a little bit different. He's a lot different. God's made him that way. 
The way that man thinks and feels is different than the way woman thinks and feels. And it's supposed to be that way. I don't know why this came to my mind and I haven't seen it in years, but uh, actually I came in this morning. I was reading through my notes and I thought of the movie, My Fair Lady. That's a blast from the past, right? But if you remember in that movie, the professor and his assistant sing a silly song entitled, A Hymn to him. And in it, they ask the question, why can't women be more like a man? Some of the lyrics go like this. Would you, I I had to look it up in the internet because I couldn't remember all of them. I just remember the story. But it says, would you be wondered if I never sent you flowers? Or would you, excuse me, I can't even read my own writing. Would you be wounded if I never sent you flowers? If I were hours late for dinner, would you bellow? If I forgot your silly birthday, would you fuss? Why can't women be just like us? And there's a reason, isn't there? Well, of course, a woman is not a man, and neither should she desire to be. And it's just as ridiculous to expect a man to act and react like a woman. Either way, it's ridiculous. There may be times when maybe, I confess, uh, maybe as wives... You wish your husband was more like a woman, so at least you could understand him. But it's not going to (laughs) happen. Our culture's attempt at making us unisex is against God's design and devalues the worth of man and woman. A man should celebrate her husband's masculine nature. Compliment him. Enjoy him being a man, not trying to change him into something else. His value is partially in being a man and that doesn't mean he goes about dragging his knuckles on the ground guys and drooling that's not what it means it means that he lives out his glorified masculinity the way God intended him to so to live out your masculine nature means that you provide for your family you take responsibility you protect and nurture your family you do the work that needs to be done you provide provide a sense of security and strength It is disconcerting to me that psychologists are finding that one of the major problems in our culture is the absence of the male in the home. Duh. Time Magazine article from a few years back had a feature story on the disappearing dad. In this article, studies of, this is over 15 years ago, so studies of young criminals have found that more than 70% of all juveniles in in, uh, institutions come from fatherless homes. Children from broken families are nearly twice as likely as those of two-parent families to drop out of school. More and more homes have absentee fathers. Way back in 1960, 17% of the children were living apart from biological fathers. By the year 2000, it had doubled to over 40-some percent. And the latest things that I've seen, it's gotten worse and it's closer to 50 percent. During the same period, juvenile crime has went uh, through the roof. These missing men are not only men in biblical sense, they are boys, barbarians, and predators because they have no model. So they wonder about... Of avoiding responsibility. And the psychological problem is clear to see. It's caused by an absent male figures in the formative years of a child's life. That's enormous. If people ask, why do you put so much emphasis on children's and youth ministry? It's where our culture needs us. I say this men, please know that you're valuable. No one can take your place. You're not only important as a physical welfare, your children, you're important in a psychological warfare that's going on. So but spend time with your children. You may give them many things, that's wonderful. But if you're not giving them your time, it won't mean much. Children, guys, are your greatest life's work. Your children deserve the investment of your time. They deserve to live in a home where a man is a, of the house is living example of the life and love of Jesus Christ. 
That's how we should define what a man is. And then lastly, I would say that a man should pray for his family. I've decided to end this service today and this time with putting a list of eight things that I've had in my last two Bibles. I've had this one for about 17 years. And uh, when the pages start falling out and I can't glue them in, I'll get another Bible. So I know this is the second Bible I've had this in. So I'm guessing for the last 30 years, I've had these eight things in the back of my Bible to remind me of what I need to do and be for my family. And I'm going to put some of them up. And I said, first, a man would pray for, let's back up. There you go. Man would pray for my spouse and then for my children and grandchildren. Okay. Then the next slide has three on there. The first three. Things that I pray for my, began praying for my children over 30 some years ago. Now some of them are grown, but I, I don't stop praying those things because they're still important. But now I've added a layer of grandchildren. I know what it would be like as men of the church to begin to pray some of these types of things. You make your own list, but to pray some of those things over some of the children that we are ministering to here at Lifeway. One, that they should choose to follow Jesus. Most important. Number two, that they would marry a godly spouse. I don't know about you, but we began praying for my children's spouse before they even thought about dating. Sounds weird, doesn't it? We prayed that God would prepare the right person for them when the time was right. Number three, that their thoughts would be pure. I don't have to really explain much about that in the world that we live in. Not only with all kinds of addictions, but pornography and everything else. Uh, you know, men are, are uh, visual, un- unfortunately. So we have temptations that are different sometimes than you, than you women do. But that our thoughts would be pure. Amen? Amen? Next slide. Number four, that they would choose friends wisely. So important, especially in formative years. Help them. Nurture friendships with positive people where you know their parents and you know what's going on. Yeah, you can get involved there, mom and dad and grandparents. Number five, that they would learn to manage money. Money can be an addiction too. But if you go down the wrong road and get too much trouble, it controls your life. So number six, that they would have the courage to do what is right. Put that in there because that kind of fills in the gaps of other things in life. Number seven, that they would make a difference in this world. You know why? Because this life is not about us. If you don't believe me, read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, the very first line. It says, guess what? It's not about you. So if you're a follower of Jesus, it is about loving others, serving others, And being in a relationship with the Savior who through the Holy Spirit would infill you so that you could do the work that I called you to do. So if you think it's about you, (laughs) baloney. Number eight, that the love of money or addictions would not overtake them. So what's your list? It may be longer, shorter, whatever, it doesn't matter. But I pray as men of God that you would Pray not only for your kids and grandkids, your families, but did you make an emphasis to begin to pray as well for those that we interact? You know, uh, the little Henri, I didn't make it up, so parents don't get upset at me, but on that poster that's about VBS, it says on, the, on there uh, different words in Australia for different words here, and it says children. You know what it says? Ankle biters. (laughs) So when you run across an ankle biter, it's a little annoying. Have you thought about really praying for that ankle biter? (laughs) Yeah? That would be something more positive than scolding them. Now you could share what the right behavior is in love. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see how we can make a difference and be an influence in a horrible, broken culture 
to a broken world that needs role models. Amen? Let's pray.